This week on Newsmakers, joining us from Capitol Hill, South Dakota Senator John Thune, the chair of the Republican Conference, number three in leadership. In studio here, Burgess Everett with Politico and Niels Lesniewski with CQ Roll Call. Niels has the first question. Go ahead. Senator Thune, you're a member of the Finance Committee, uh, and there's been a lot of talk with the Highway Trust Fund going to uh, reach a critical stage here in the coming weeks. Uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, who is, of course, a Democratic senator from New York, a member of the Democratic leadership and on the Finance Committee, has just said that it, recently that it's iffy that there will be a deal done to avert a shortfall of the Highway Trust Fund uh, to find the revenue to patch that hole. Uh, what's your view on the prospects that there's going to be an agreement before the middle of uh, July when this really gets to a head? I think they're better than iffy, Niels, uh, but it is, it's, it's tough. I mean, there aren't a lot of ways to find um, offsets for uh, highway trust fund uh, spending, but we do hit this crisis sometime in July, perhaps uh, might be pushed a little bit into early August, but it's, a, it's coming, and it is a crisis, and we have to deal with it. And it always seems like around here, unfortunately, that it has to become a real crisis before you, you find the, the, uh, you know, the critical mass, the impetus to get something done. Uh, I think the House will act uh, on, an, on an extension, um, perhaps before the Senate. We'll see. We're scheduled to mark up uh, later today, or at least start the markup uh, of, a, of a solution that would come out of the Senate. And it'll be hard probably finding agreement on what those offsets are, but I think that we can, I think we can do that. I, there are some things that have been proposed by Democrats, some things that have been pro proposed by Republicans, and usually on highway trust fund issues, uh, people eventually kind of come together because it's that important to the country and to the economy. So I, I hope we, we, can, we can find the, the way forward. Um, there certainly seems to be the will on both sides to do that, but as usual, uh, you know, the devil's in the details, and, and coming up with what that right solution is uh, isn't going to be an easy process, but uh, it's necessary. We've got to get this done. Senator Thune, are offsets necessary? Well, they are, Greta, I believe. I don't think we can continue to borrow from the general fund, and that's what we've done now to the tune of about $53 billion uh, since, I think, 2008. You know, when we when we have a shortfall, instead of paying for it, we uh, we just uh, put it on the backs of our children and grandchildren and borrow it, put it on the debt. We can't keep doing that. If we're going to have a highway program, we've got to pay for it, and we're either going to have to dr have a dramatically smaller highway program, um, or we've got to come up with the ways to uh, to make sure that we're doing this and and accounting for it, so that it's not being put on the debt. I, I think there's general consensus about that. I mean, there are some people who will probably propose because it would be the easy way out to just uh, you know just do a general fund transfer as we've done before but we've got to come to grips with reality here one is uh, we've got this short-term problem we need to fix probably until at least the end of the year maybe in the next year but then we've got to confront the reality of a you know a, a five or six year highway bill reauthorization uh, that is funded and and come up with that funding mechanism and there are lots of different proposals out there right now about how best to do that. But, you know, the immediate crisis is going to be the short-term extension. But to your question, I think it's got to be paid for, yes. Senator, uh, one of your colleagues, Bob Corker, touched the third rail recently. He said, let's raise the gas tax on this issue. Uh, the problem is uh, gas tax receipts haven't been keeping up with spending. So what do you propose uh, to deal with this long term? Do you think that the gas tax should be looked at in terms of increasing it? That's if you want to keep a user fee based program, that's I think you know probably the most logical place that uh, that most folks would end up and and Senator Corker, Senator Murphy came out with a proposal. I think it's a six cent increase in the first year, six cent in the second year, and then index it after that. And indexing it would help, but you do have more fuel efficient cars, you've got more hybrids on the road. so it isn't raising the amount that it, it has in the past. But taking those things into consideration, it is still something that highway users pay for. And so there are reasons why that, if you're looking at all the various scenarios and options that are out there, if you have to raise revenue to do this, uh, is, uh, is an option I think that's being discussed. Now, there are other things that are being talked about as well. Um, some of our members on the Republican side and some Democrats are talking about using repatriation, repatriated funds. Uh, multinational corporations that have earnings that are parked offshore right now, uh, getting them to bring them back into the country, tax them at a lower level, but that would generate some revenue that would fund things for a time. But that doesn't, that's not a permanent solution either. 
Um, there are House members that I've talked to who believe that opening up federal lands to energy expo exploration uh, would uh, more than cover the shortfall in the Highway Trust Fund over a period of time. And that's something I think you'll probably hear more discussion about as well. So there are several ideas out there about a longer term fix, um, all of which have you know, shortcomings and, and their own liabilities. The, the highway, uh, the gas tax that Senator Corker has proposed is uh, something that up until now, at least, the administration, the president, has not e expressed any kind mm -hmm. of an openness to. Uh, they sound now a little bit more open to that, but I think uh, until they get to that point, it's going to be awfully hard to feature uh, Congress going forward with that sort of a solution if you don't have the administration weighing in or engaging on it. So we'll see what happens on the longer term fix. Right now we're kind of focused on this immediate crisis. Right, and, and so on the short term, Senator Thune, I just want to be clear, if in the end the only <coughs> uh, uh, option that Democrats put on the table is a general fund transfer, are Republicans a no vote? I would say yes. Uh, I, there may be a handful that they could get that would vote for that, but um, by and large, I just think where our caucus is right now is that we can't continue to do what we've been doing for the past uh, five years, and that's uh, when we have this 10 to $15 billion shortfall every year is just put it on the backs of our children and grandchildren and add it to the debt. Uh, I don't think we see that as an acceptable solution. These things need to be paid for. There have been a number of things offered. Um, Senator Hatch on the Finance Committee on the Republican side put forward a list of offsets that would get you the necessary number, and Senator Wyden's put uh, forward a list that would get you the necessary number. His are mostly tax increases. Uh, ours are mostly spending reductions. There's probably something that uh, can be found that would be middle ground, and, and if there are tax compliance issues that don't represent new taxes and some spending reforms that would get you to a, a place that you might uh, be able to come up with a necessary uh, shortfall and cover it. Uh, that that I, I think that's a solution that's out there. But we'll see in the next few days. As I said, we've got a finance committee markup scheduled for today, and then another one I think subsequent to that when we get back uh, after the July 4th break, where we'll try and resolve this issue. Senator Thune, uh, turning to uh, energy and environment issues for just a minute. There has been an amendment that's been floated on the Republican side by Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Uh, that would effectively, presumably, block the administration's uh, EPA regulations for existing power plants. And it seems that the uh, Democrats may be going to lengths to avoid having a vote on that amendment on the Senate floor. Uh, do you think that that amendment is going to have to get a vote before the November election in order to uh, move some sort of must-pass legislation, be it the highway bill, be it uh, a continuing resolution to fund the government or something like that? I think any um, legislation that's brought to the floor, the, 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 the leader, the Democrat leader, the majority, should assume that uh, Republicans are going to try and get a vote on that amendment. It's incredibly important in a lot of states. And, you know, I represent a state where coal-fired power is a very big part of our energy mix, and this is going to dramatically diminish uh, coal-fired power in this country. In fact, I think the goal of the administration and the EPA is to just completely wipe out coal-fired power. And it is a reliable, affordable energy source, probably the best one that we have right now until we come up with uh, other replacements for that. Uh, I, it's hard to, hard to see where um, what they're attempting to do would do anything but dramatically drive up electricity rates and really hurt the pocketbooks of a lot of middle-income families in this country. So it's important to a lot of our members. I think it's important to a lot of Democrats, which is why um, Senator Reid, I don't think, wants to have it voted on the floor, or for that matter, even at the uh, committee level. The appropriations committees uh, are they're trying to, to move uh, appropriation bills right now. Amendments are being offered, and they're being, the bills are being pulled down because Democrats don't want to offer or don't want to vote on some of the amendments that Republicans are offered in, in offering. And one of those would be this EPA amendment. But I think you have to assume that uh, any significant legislative vehicle that moves across the Senate floor in the foreseeable future, there will be an attempt to, uh, to at least get a vote on, on this EPA issue. And uh, so stay tuned on that. Uh, we'll see what happens. But it's awfully important to the economic vitality of a lot of states around this country and to the pocketbooks of a lot of middle-income Americans. Uh, Senator, last fall uh, we saw Republicans take a hard line on funding Obamacare, which resulted to, in a government shutdown. Do you think your party should take a stand on anything, maybe the EPA, maybe the Exxon Bank, uh, in September uh, on a funding bill when funding runs out? 
Well, I, I think, Burgess, that we'll probably have, hopefully, pretty spirited and vigorous debates on, on uh, hopefully, on EPA, if we can get it, at least on the floor, to get it discussed and debated, uh, maybe on Exxon Bank, too. But I don't think there's, you know, no Republican is talking about uh, using that as leverage to shut the government down. I don't think anybody, we've got a, a budget number that's put in, been put in place now that we're operating under, and uh, any continuing resolution that gets adopted this year, I assume, would uh, meet that number, and so the, the spending issue shouldn't really be a question. So the question is, are there other uh, of these matters that we would like to get votes on that um, might be a part of that discussion? And I think it's entirely possible that they, they could be, but um, certainly there isn't any Republican in the Senate that's talking about using the, uh, uh, you know, any kind of leverage in that circumstance uh, to shut the government down. That's just not something that anybody's talking about. So there might be a, a bit of a, a truce here in September to get through the election, you think, on spending? Well, my guess is uh, because those numbers were sort of locked in by the budget agreement that was adopted uh, earlier this year, uh, that um, you would see, I think, both, both probably Republicans and Democrats uh, coming, if, if, every, if the Democrats agree to stay under the limits that were included there, then I suspect that uh, that issue probably won't be as contentious as it has been in some past years where we're having a real debate about the level of spending. Because that spending has been agreed upon, and if the numbers that the continuing resolution or whatever spending vehicle we end up voting on uh, stays within those or those parameters, my guess is that there won't be probably, uh, that may be one of those things that gets uh, done in a way that um, you know finishes up the end of the fiscal year and then everybody can go and litigate these issues in the campaigns in November. And I'm guessing right now that's probably uh, what happens, but uh, again, around here, you, you never really know until you get there. Uh, Senator Thune, I wanted to ask you a, a, a different sort of Finance Committee question. Uh, recently, the House Ways and Means Committee uh, announced uh, or said that uh, Senator Grassley, who, like you, is a member of the Finance Committee, may have been uh, subjected to some extra scrutiny, or at least there may have been an attempt to subject him to some extra scrutiny by the, uh, the Internal Revenue Service uh, and by Lois Lerner in particular. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious if you have any updates on the state of the Senate Finance Committee's investigation into the IRS and whether or not uh, senators have all been reviewing their own personal tax histories to see if, uh, in fact, anyone else other than Senator Grassley may have been subjected to any sort of enhanced scrutiny. We're all very concerned that we hear, when we hear that the IRS, in addition to targeting political, conservative political groups, may be targeting conservative senators who have been critics of the IRS. And Senator Grassley has a reputation around here in terms of uh, his integrity that is just, uh, it's, it's impeccable. And so, uh, these um, suggestions by Lois Lerner, uh, perhaps others at the IRS that they ought to somehow audit him or examine, I mean, that's just, again, another example of an agency with a bunch of people who really have uh, an agenda that's run amok. And so I, I, I think, is there a discussion about it? Yes, it's kind of based on those revelations that came out on these, these emails and, and um, it's, it's generated, I think, a good amount of discussion. But with respect to the Finance Committee, as you mentioned, both Senator Grassley and I serve on that committee, we were trying to get this uh, concluded, this investigation, that, that a bipartisan investigation, I might add, by the Finance Committee, but we can't get answers from the IRS. It's like everything else. I mean, they are, they are evasive, uh, they are misleading, they are not providing answers in a timely way, there is no accountability there. And so um, at least the Republicans on the Finance Committee are incredibly frustrated. I hope the Democrats are too at the lack of answers that we're getting from the IRS. And so uh, this latest revelation about Senator Grassley is sort of piling on, uh, in my view, um, a, a, a very cumulative uh, amount of evidence that these guys were, they were completely using that agency, which has tremendous power on people's lives, tremendous power, the ability to, to ruin and destroy people's lives if they were using it for political purposes. And, and that's just wrong. And I think the American people are sick and tired of it. Uh, I hope we can get, uh, if we can't get these, uh, these investigations that Congress is trying to do concluded, we need, a, we need a special prosecutor to look into this. I hope that Eric Holder at the Justice Department will conclude, based upon this recent evidence and evidence that's come before, mm -hmm. that it's uh, time to do that. And uh, the American people deserve answers, and um, they're not getting them. Sir, can I also ask, uh, you're talking about this pent-up frustration with Republicans dealing with the administration. Over in the House, Speaker Boehner is now 
talking about suing the Obama administration for executive overreach. I mean, do you agree with that tack? And is this something that you and other Senate Republicans might associate themselves with? I think that most of us, Burgess, will support the um, House's actions. I think that Speaker Boehner is has recognized the enormous overreach of the administration, uh, the way in which they're going outside the bounds of the law, that this is uh, unlawful behavior by an administration needs to be challenged, and there are very limited ways in which you can do that. So the Speaker's lawsuit is an attempt by House Republicans to hold this administration to account. Uh, we support those efforts. Um, I don't, I, my question is, I'm not sure, you know, could something like that happen in the Senate? probably have to get the votes in order to get a resolution to do that, and I suspect in the Democrat-controlled Senate that's unlikely, but I certainly support what the House is doing. Senator, you support this um, when it could be a cost to the taxpayers in the millions. It could take months to get through the court system and may not even be taken up during this administration and have an impact on a possible Republican president in the future. You know, those are all good questions, Greta, and I think things that... Um, it, it, people right now, as they look at these issues, are saying, uh, perhaps that's true. I mean, I don't know this is a process that's fairly new to me, but I do think that um, the American people are tired of spending millions and millions and millions of dollars more uh, because of the regulatory overreach of a lot of these ex executive agencies that are acting outside of their lawful, their legal authority. And some, some, somehow that's got to be challenged. And we get the question, I get the question every week when I'm back in South Dakota or traveling elsewhere around the country, can't you guys do something about this? And we have limited tools at our disposal. And, of course, uh, the legislative branch of the government, through the appropriations process, sometimes can control a little bit of that. But you still have here in the United States Senate uh, Harry Reid and the Democrat majority blocking any attempt to do that and, and protecting the president from the accountability I think the American people deserve. So there are limited tools at your disposal. Um, again, this is something that the speaker has uh, just recently announced, and uh, obviously uh, many of us are looking at it as a, as a you know, possibility, one way in which we could get that accountability, that we could hold the administration to account and maintain the checks and balances I think the American people expect uh, of their uh, leadership here in Washington. I wanted to turn to uh, politics and, and looking at the 2014 map, which we mentioned a little bit earlier in the context of uh, the appropriations process going forward into September, because that'll be right before an election. Uh, looking ahead to the, the 2014 election, uh, aside from the, the big picture question of what you think the prospects are that, that Republicans might uh, take back control of the United States Senate, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, specifically, and, and maybe a little bit ironically, uh, but in Kentucky, the, uh, your party's leader in the Senate has come under a fairly intense uh, challenge. To what extent do you think that you're part of perhaps the, the reason or the example number one that people go after party leaders because you're you're the person who successfully was able to um, oust the uh, Democratic leader in, in South Dakota. And can you talk a little bit about how that uh, race and your success there may have changed things uh, since then? Yeah, sure. And, and I think, Niels, that what, what uh, in my um, example, of course, in South Dakota, uh, you know, I argued that uh, Senator Daschle at the time um, was using his leadership position in a way that was contrary to where a majority of South Dakotans were. And Senator Daschle was a very different example in the sense that he was misaligned with the views of the majority of the people in our state. And I think eventually that caught up with him. I think the, the big difference between that and where the Senator McConnell is in the Kentucky race is Senator Con McConnell's views on the issues and the way he represents the state uh, very much, I think, reflects the majority view in the state of Kentucky. And so you've got, you don't have um, uh, uh, an individual whose, um, you know, political positions, his leadership is, uh, is out of alignment and not representative of the views of the people in his state. So I think there are, you know, there are people who will draw the parallels that uh, these are attempts by uh, challengers to, uh, to defeat members who are leaders in the United States Senate. But the circumstances, the dynamics surrounding each of these races is very different. And what's being advanced by the Obama administration 
uh, those things, uh, those issues and those positions are going to be very out of step with where uh, Kentuckians are at. So uh, I think the prospects for Senator McConnell look very good. Um, is, you know, in the last couple of elections uh, voted overwhelmingly for the Republican nominee for president. Uh, and if you look at their views on the issues and what's being advanced by the Obama administration, uh, those things, uh, those issues and those positions are going to be very out of step with where uh, Kentuckians are at. So uh, I think the prospects for Senator McConnell look very good because he's running against somebody whose positions are going to be very much left of the state. And I think he's much more uh, in line with where his state's voters are. We have about five minutes left here. Uh, Senator McConnell thrashed his Tea Party opponent in the primary. This week we saw Thad Cochran surprise a lot of people by beating Chris McDaniel. Um, you know, Eric Cantor lost in Virginia, the majority leader, but he's looking more and more like a blip. Uh, the Senate Republicans have been able to fend off these uh, conservative challengers. Do you think the conservatives movement has hit a high watermark in terms of challenging sitting senators? You know, Burgess, I think that a lot of um, and, and when labels get attached to people, uh, I think that the, the Senate, most of us here in the Senate are conservatives. And so the conservative movement, I think, is alive and well. But I know there's a perception around the country that uh, these are races between the establishment and the Tea Party. I welcome the views that are brought to the table by the Tea Party and the energy that they bring. And I hope that that'll be converted into going out and trying to defeat Democrats in the fall, because that's where the real contrast is. And most of these races that have uh, broken here of late, where you've had primaries, uh, I think if there have been individual circumstances in those races. The, the quality of the campaigns, uh, the turnout efforts have made the difference in most of these races. So they're, they're kind of um, individualized, uh, customized, if you will, races in various places around the country where I think quality of the candidates, quality of the campaigns has really made a difference. But I won't for a minute suggest that uh, we should not be listening carefully to the views are being articulated by some of these people who are, are bringing challenges in these primaries. I think it's important for us to have a robust discussion within our party, but I think that you know there are most of, most of the folks who are, who are running uh, for re-election in the United States Senate, and a lot of our challenges are, are right of center, mainstream Republicans who are believe in limited government, believe in you know, personal freedom coupled with individual responsibility, believe in peace through strength. Uh, they're pretty much uh, down the line. Uh, economic uh, conservatives, fiscal conservatives, and I think that's where most people in this country are. I think most people vote pocketbook issues, and I think that's where uh, most of our candidates and most of our incumbents who are running for re-election are. And Senator, are you preparing for a primary challenge in the future? I think you always have to be prepared for that. You know, it, the, the day and in, in, in time in which we live, uh, a lot of outside groups spending that you don't have any control over. I think that every uh, candidate who uh, gets into this arena or incumbent running for re-election uh, needs to be paying close attention to the to their home state, to their home district, staying very connected uh, to the people and to the issues that are important to them. Um, people in this country, and I, people in South Dakota, have a way of punishing uh, folks who get out of step with what their interests are. And so I think that's what's incumbent upon anybody who wants to enter the political arena is that uh, you better be prepared to defend yourself against uh, the attacks that are going to come from any direction at you. But you know we've seen a lot more primaries of late. And uh, I suspect that's probably not going to change in the future. Um, but it's uh, it's our democracy at work. And Senator, I don't I don't uh, you know I don't think that's a bad thing. Senator, on the policy side, there one tension between uh, so-called establishment Republicans and Tea Party is this uh, debate over whether or not to reauthorize the Export Import Bank. Do you support reauthorization of that agency? You know I have supported that in the past, Greta. And I will look at, as we get into that, the debate this time, uh, determine what the role of the bank has been, should be in our market, um, what types of reforms and greater transparency can be brought to it. I haven't made a final decision on that yet. Um, I think we have to constantly examine these agencies, uh, what their role is, um, what the, the cost and benefits are uh, to our economy, and, and make sure that we're creating conditions where a free market economy uh, can really thrive and prosper. And um, you know, some of these agencies are put in place at times in our nation's history uh, where there was a need for that, and sometimes perhaps they've outlived their usefulness. And I'm not suggesting that's the case with Exim Bank. I think we have to look at these uh, and, and have a debate about what the role of these institutions should be going forward 
and, uh, and for sure um, do everything we can to bring about the kind of transparency and the type of reforms that uh, if these uh, agencies are going to continue to function, that will make them uh, more accountable, uh, more efficient, and uh, I think uh, better for the American taxpayer. I, I think we can get in one more question here. Let me, let me just end on a, a, a question about a different kind of primary, and that's the, the one that comes up in 2016. Uh, I know that at one point in time you told a group of uh, school children that you were not particularly interested necessarily in, in having higher aspirations of your own, but I'm curious, South Dakota's not all that far away from Iowa. Uh, if you're planning any travel there or if you have any other sort of plans um, beyond uh, trying to get the uh, majority in the uh, Senate. Well, I hope to get to Iowa to help Joni Ernst, our Senate candidate over there, Niels. Um, you know, I don't, I've not rule. you don't rule anything out. I think when you're in politics, if you wanna make a difference in public life, you don't rule out potential opportunities or, or closed doors. Um, I've said this, and I said it at that school group, and I've said it more recently than that. I'm not at the moment running for president. Right now, my political activity is focused on getting the majority of the United States Senate. Um, but that isn't to say somewhere down the road, uh, as, as things start to pick up, you don't make uh, an evaluation and determine whether or not you, you know, where you might be able to make the biggest difference or, or contribute or try and have an impact for your state and your country. But um, at the moment, uh, my political activities are geared very much toward our activities here in the Senate today and what we might be able to do if we could win a few seats and get the majority in November. Senator John Thune, Chair of the Republican Conference, thank you very much for being our newsmaker. Thanks, Greta. Good to be with you. Let me turn to our two reporters here and uh, talk a little bit about what we heard from the number three in leadership in the Senate. Um, we began on the policy front, Niels Lesniewski, when they come back from this 4th of July recess, the highway transportation bill is going to be staring many of them down. Right. Uh, Senator Ron Wyden, who's the Finance Committee Chairman, uh, has said this week that his expectation is that the date uh, that this is going to become a problem is July the 18th, which will give them just about two weeks uh, to figure it out when they come back from the uh, week-long uh, July 4th break. And what Senator Thuden said was interesting in that there's, there may well be, because he was talking about tax compliance issues being some area where there might be able to be fi find common ground, uh, the Democratic proposal that's out there is about half tax compliance um, revenue. So if that's the case, then we may only be looking at like a four or five billion dollar hole instead of a nine or ten billion dollar hole that will actually need to be filled in the next couple of weeks. Well, you heard though from the Senator Burgess that, that there, if there are not offsets for the highway spending bill, Republicans are a no vote. Right. I mean, it's not unprecedented for them to miss this deadline. It's happened in the past temporarily, but my sense is these things seem to, in, in this climate, always wait till the last minute. I have a hard time believing that uh, four months before the election, Congress is going to take this sort of failure and have all these summer construction projects dry up. I think they will probably pass some sort of patch at the last minute that is very difficult to understand how it's paid for and hard to explain to the public, and they will relitigate this fight after the election. Uh, Niels Osuski, so between now and election day, <coughs> what's what, what, what will the Senate be working on? Not much other than, <laughs> well, you know, there, are th there, will be, there will be a number of uh, sort of staged political votes that will be staged by Democrats that are designed to help uh, incumbent Democratic senators in tough races. Uh, but other than that, the primary function of the Senate will be preventing the highway trust fund shortfall and keeping the government open. And that's going to be the biggest uh, key. One of the things that was very interesting that Senator Thune said was that Republicans will use every opportunity to try and get a vote on the on the EPA uh, greenhouse gas regulation amendment, but then he turned around and subsequently told Burgess uh, in response to a question that there was no appetite for shutting down the government. So trying to figure out how to thread that needle will be mm -hmm. a key. I, yeah. get, I get the sense nobody nobody wants to have this government shutdown fight again. Of Republicans got creamed in the polls last uh, fall when they were blamed largely for the shutdown. Uh, ever since the 
story has been about the president's declining approval ratings and how that translates to the Democratic senators who are running for re-election. So I just have a hard time believing that the GOP wants to take that spotlight off the president and put it back on themselves. So I, I think that uh, they will probably beg away from uh, forcing a vote on anything contentious on a spending bill. Do you think, though, that sentiment that you're expressing is one that runs throughout the Republican Party, including the Tea Party faction of the party? It's really hard to say. I mean, uh, everybody I knew that was way smarter mm -hmm. than me last fall said that we would never be fighting uh, over defunding Obamacare in a way that would shut down the government. So certainly crazier things have happened. But the biggest difference, I think, is the calendar in terms of the election being around the corner. You're shaking your head. I, th I think that's I think that's right, and and certainly one of the things as we as we look towards the fall, uh, where the polls start to go in some of these races, where we see the committees and, and outside groups start pulling out money and essentially throwing some candidates under the bus, mm -hmm. as always happens, uh, getting into October. Some of what we do uh, and what we see happen in the Senate may well be dictated by which races are competitive as we get towards uh, Election Day.